Hello, my name is Evan, and thanks for checking out part five in my series on the history of comic book adaptations to film. My last video covered the first half of the 90s, 1990 to 1994, and this video is going to cover 1995 to 1999. So let's start out with 95. The bi biggest comic book film of 1995 was easily Batman Forever. It was technically a sequel to Batman Returns, but it really had uh, very little in the way of continuity with that film. Returns had done uh, decently at the box office, but Warner Brothers really thought it could have done better. And in their minds, this was due partly to the perceived dark nature of Burton's films. So they kind of wanted to go with something a bit more lighthearted, a bit more accessible to mainstream audiences. Uh, WB decided to have Burton just be a producer instead of directing. To replace Burton, they went with Joel Schumacher, who now is a big name, but at the time his biggest hits um, were just things like St. Elmo's Fire and The Lost Boys. The studio thought that he'd bring that you know much lighter tone to the Batman series they were looking for. Michael Keaton was also replaced as Batman. There were there are conflicting reports as to why exactly this was the case. Rumors surfaced that Keaton was asking for too much money. Keaton claimed that he didn't like the direction Schumacher wanted to take the series in. Also, the studio supposedly wanted a younger actor for Bruce Wayne who was more traditionally attractive. This led them to casting Val Kilmer in the part. Reportedly, John, Johnny Depp and Daniel Day-Lewis were also considered. Kind of hard to picture Daniel Day-Lewis in a comic book movie, but I'm sure he would have been an amazing Batman. Forever was the first of this series to feature Robin. Marlon Wayans was again considered for the role and was even signed. However, before filming, Schumacher changed his mind and decided to go with Chris O'Donnell. Robin's backstory is similar to that of the comics. He was an acrobat whose family was killed. However, in the film, unlike the comics, Two-Face is the one who killed his family. Batman Forever is a decent film, but in, unfortunately it started the descent into camp that culminated in perhaps the worst big budget comic book movie ever, 1997's Batman and Robin. Another major release from 1995 to be taken from comics was Judge Dredd, starring Sylvester Stallone. It was directed by Danny Cannon, who also made I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. Judge Dredd is a very popular comic character in Britain from the magazine 2000 AD. I unfortunately haven't read any Judge Dredd comics, but apparently from what I hear, the movie is only faithful to the general idea and has a much different tone from the comics. The film also featured one of the most annoying actors in history in a pretty large role, and that is Rob Schneider. They originally wanted Joe Pesci, you know, and obviously if Joe Pesci turns you down, the next logical choice is Rob Schneider. I, you know, I heard he was also Scorsese's original choice for Goodfellas. The film didn't do well with critics, and it was considered a commercial flop as well. It only made $113 million on a $90 million budget. A film called Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight was also released in 1995. However, it was an original story not based on the Tales from the Crypt comics. The director was Ernest Dickerson, who has directed episodes of The Wire, Dexter, and The Walking Dead, as well as the terrible Snoop Dogg film Bones. He was also the cinematographer on several Spike Lee films, including Malcolm X and Do the Right Thing. The film starred Jada Pinkett Smith, Billy Zane, Tom and Thomas Hayden Church, and William Sadler. Finally, we also have Tank Girl in 1995, based on the comic created by Alan Martin and Jamie Hewlett in the late 1980s. Hewlett went on to be the animator for the virtual band Gorillaz. The Tank Girl movie was directed by Rachel Talele and starred Lori Petty of Point Break as the title character, along with Ice-T and Naomi Watts. The year after that, in 1996, there were no comic book films that I would consider major for that year, but there were four minor adaptations. One of these was a sequel to The Crow, titled The Crow City of Angels. 
It was directed by Tim Pope, who is mostly known for directing music videos for The Cure, which kind of makes sense. He would do a Crow movie. The cast included Vincent Perez, Iggy Pop, Mia Kirshner, and the feature Punisher, Thomas Jane. This film was the first of many comic book adaptations to be written by David S. Goyer. At the time, he had only written B-horror movies such as The Puppet Masters and Demonic Toys. He would go on to write all three installments in both the Blade trilogy and Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, as well as Man of Steel. The Crow City of Angels is absolutely terrible and honestly painful to watch due to the annoying red tint that pervades the film. Both Pope and Goyer disowned it due to studio interference. There was also another Tales from the Crypt film that came out in 96, titled Bordello of Blood. It had a kind of a weird cast with Dennis Miller, Corey Feldman, and Chris Sarandon. The director was Gilbert Adler, who would later produce Constantine and Superman Returns. We also have Barb Wire, based on the Dark Horse comic series that ran from 94 to 95. The cast featured Pamela Anderson, Udo Kier, and Tamara Morrison, who would later play Jango Fett in Star Wars Episode II. Lastly, there was also a direct-to-video adaptation of Vampirella, a comic book character created in 1969. And with that, we now come to perhaps the most infamous of all comic book films, Batman and Robin. Joel Schumacher returned to direct, and Tim Burton was no longer involved in any capacity. Chris O'Donnell reprised the role of Robin, whose costume was based on that of Nightwing in this movie, but Val Kilmer did not return as Batman. Instead, George Clooney played Bruce Wayne. Clooney definitely toned down the dark aspects of the character from the previous installments. He was kind of more of a better, well-adjusted uh, Batman in the previous ones. The main villain was Mr. Freeze. His origin story was based on the animated show Batman, not the comics. He uh, was played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was an interesting choice to say the least, and this was one of many missteps the movie made. Schwarzenegger made Mr. Freeze into a campy joke, making some sort of cold-related pun every five minutes. Also considered for the role were Anthony Hopkins, Sylvester Stallone, and Hulk Hogan. Hogan probably would have been even worse than Arnold, if that's even possible. The other villains were Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy and Robert Swenson as Bane. Thurman definitely dialed up the camp for her role, but wasn't quite as bad as Mr. Freeze. Bane is almost nothing like his comic counterpart. In the comics, Bane is one of Batman's most intelligent and dangerous rogues. However, in this film, he is just a dumb brute that does the bidding of Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy. Batman and Robin also introduced Batgirl to the series. In a bit of uninspired casting, Schumacher chose Alicia Silverstone. She was very popular at the time, mainly for her part in the 1995 film Clueless. Her career took a hit from this movie that she never really recovered from. Batgirl's origin was changed from the source material. Originally, she was Commis Commissioner Gordon's daughter, but in Batman and Robin, she is Alfred's niece. This change makes sense because Gordon is not nearly as important in these films as he is in the comics. The film was an unmitigated disaster. Critics lambasted it, and it is often considered the worst superhero movie ever. The damage was so severe that Batman did not appear on film again until 2005 when it was completely rebooted. Schumacher and Clooney were at one point set to return for a sequel, but this quickly changed when the film was released. The potential sequel was going to be called Batman Triumphant and featured Scarecrow as the villain. Instead, WB considered doing a Batman Beyond film based on the animated series of the same name. The show featured an elderly Bruce Wayne training a young protege in the future. This idea was also abandoned, and the studio made plans for Year One. Batman Year One was a well-received graphic novel by Frank Miller that told Batman's origins. WB got Miller to write the script for the film version with Darren Aronofs Aronofsky of Requiem for a Dream directing. The film was going to be radically different than most conceptions of Batman and featured Alfred as a black mechanic. 
This was also abandoned for a Batman vs. Superman film. This too was tossed aside for Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. Also in 1997, we have the film adaptation of Men in Black, starring Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. The director was Barry Sonnenfeld, known for Get Shorty and being the cinematographer on a few Coen Brothers films. The movie is apparently quite different from the source material. In the comics, the Men in Black face all sorts of supernatural creatures, such as werewolves, demons, mutants, and zombies, but the movie version just focused on aliens. Men in Black was very successful, grossing almost $600 million on a $90 million budget. It also won the Oscar for Best Makeup and spawned two sequels. 1997 also saw the release of Spawn, based on the Todd McFarlane character. Spawn was created in 1992 and became quite popular in the mid-90s. Michael Jai White portrayed the titled character, making him the first African-American superhero on film. It was directed by Mark A.Z. DePay, who since then has mostly done made-for-TV and directed video films. Finally, we have the movie Steel, starring NBA player Shaquille O'Neal. It was based on the DC character of the same name, uh, aka John Henry Irons. The film was quite different from the source material and was also a massive bomb, making only 1.7 million at the box office. Moving on to the year after that, one of the first successful superhero films that didn't involve Superman or Batman was 1998's Blade. It was also Marvel's first hit film and showed that comic book films were viable properties. Blade, created in 1973 for Marvel, was a vampire hunter. The film adaptation was directed by Stephen Norrington, who went on to direct the comic book film The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It was written by David S. Goyer, who wrote the two Blade sequels as well. Wesley Snipes starred as Blade with Chris Christopherson and Stephen Dorff. Blade made over $130 million. Comic book films were now taken a bit more seriously, a fact cemented two years later by the smash hit X-Men. Two comic adaptations were released in 1999. One was Mystery Men, starring Ben Stiller, Janine Garofalo, William H. Macy, Greg Kinnear, Jeffrey Rush, and Hank Azaria. It was directed by Kinka Usher, who hasn't directed a film since. Mystery Men was pretty funny, but it bombed at the box office. It cost about $68 million to make and only grossed $33 million. However, over the years, it has garnered a better reputation and is kind of seen as a cult uh, movie now. Finally, there's the film Virus, based on the Dark Horse comic created by Chuck Farr. It starred Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Sutherland, and William Baldwin. Virus got poor reviews and flopped at the box office. Well, that's all for the comic book movies of the 1990s. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for the next installment.